Phonology. Phonemic form versus phonetic form. We're going to begin by looking at a series of words in English. All of them have a T in our heads. So when I think about these words, in every one of these words, I have the representation of a T up here in my mind. But when we transcribe them phonetically, we find that the T gets pronounced differently. And in fact, in some cases, phonetically, it's not a T at all. So, to start with, we'll look at the word hot. And there's two ways we can pronounce that word. I can pronounce it hot, which I would say is the normal pronunciation, or I can pronounce it hot, hot. And I want you to notice what happens when I hold up a piece of paper in front of my mouth and say these two words, hot, hot. In the first one, I expect that you should see the paper moving um, when I pronounce that H sound, but also when I finish the T and I move my tongue down from the alveolar ridge, a little bit of air escapes there. Hot, hot. Whereas when I pronounce the, the second way, hot, hot. In that case, that T doesn't get released. What it, what's happening is I'm actually closing my glottis at the same time that I'm blocking the airwaves with my tongue. And so when I drop my tongue from the alveolar ridge, then my no air can escape because I've closed off the glottis at the same time. Hot, hot. Okay, now compare that to the word tan. Tan, tan. Now here you really see that, that paper moving because this is what we call an aspirated T. So that aspirated, that little H, that superscript H, what it means is that there's a burst of air that comes out before I go into the vowel. So it's that burst of air that causes the paper to flap. Tan, tan. In this case, we use that little angle bracket to show that it is glottalized or unreleased. Okay, now think about stick, stick, stick. That T is gonna be more like this one here. Those T's are gonna be pretty similar. So having that S come right before it changes the pronunciation. If I were just to say tick, tick, then I would get that flapping because that one would be aspirated. Then we get this symbol here that flap, which is voiced. So in that way, it's similar to D and it is alveolar, but it's just tapping the alveolar ridge. It's not lingering there as it would with a D. So if I were to say bottom, that would not be the same, but it's bottom, bottom, where the, T, the tongue is just hitting it and then coming down. That's a distinctly American pronunciation. Now, I suppose if I were to sort of over pronounce it, I might say bottom, bottom. Now it sounds almost British, but in e American English, we would say bottom, bottom. When I think about 20, likewise, if I pronounce it very carefully, I, I can get a T in there, 20, 20. But most of the time when I pronounce it, there's no T at the end. Obviously there's a T at the beginning, but not at the end. It's 20, 20. And then the one I want to look at here is Latin, Latin. In this case, my tongue is never even getting close to the alveolar ridge. It's a glottal stop, that's all. So it's Latin, Latin. Okay, now the reason this is important is because it gets at how we represent language in our heads versus having it coming out of our mouths. Now let's compare the T's in English to ones that we can get in Hindi. We're gonna be particularly interested in this one that's labeled dental. The dentals, uh, what it means is that the tongue is just a little bit forward 
of the alveolar ridge in hindi but for our purposes we're we're going to think of these as alveolars so you've got a voiced dal which means lentil and then you've got the voiceless unaspirated dal dal which is really similar to what we get when for example stick where it's an a, an unaspirated t stick dal versus the aspirated t meaning plate tal tal and in hindi as i understand it it's a little bit more aspirated than it would be in american english or british english okay um the voiced aspirated is interesting, but it's not relevant for what we're getting into. I'll try to pronounce it for you if you're interested. It's going to be something like dar, dar. Okay, now, what I'm mostly interested in, though, is this one and this one. Now, I want to look at Hungarian. So Hungarian, again, has a contrast between T's and D's. So we've got te, which means you in formal singular, and de, which means but, or latot, which means he or she saw, versus latod, which means you see. Now, so we know that there's a contrast between T and D, but there are no aspirated T's in Hungarian. And that's what I want to get at, is there's only one way to pronounce a T in Hungarian, and that is to have a just normal released T, te, or lato. Okay, now back to English T. What we see then, again, up here in our minds, we've got this T, and it's just one. It's all T in all of those words, and we call that the phoneme. So the mental representation of the sound is our phoneme. And the phonetic representation of them is allophones. So what we see is that for that single phoneme in English, we've got, what, six different ways of pronouncing it. So there are six allophones for that single phoneme of English. Whereas in Hindi, there are two different phonemes there's the regular T and there's the aspirated T. And they're two different phonemes, meaning that in a Hindi speaker's mind, they're separate. And the reason we know they're separate is because they can mean different things. So if it's not aspirated, you get tal, then it means beat. Whereas when it's aspirated, tal, then it's plate. Very different meanings. And when you get a meaning difference, then it's got to be a phonemic difference. And that also means that there's a single allophone for both of those phonemes. Likewise, in Hungarian, where, as I said, there's only one T, so there's only one phoneme T and only one allophone. Which brings us to the question of how do we know whether they are there's more than one phoneme or just more than one allophone? Well, this is where we get into distribution. And when we're looking at distribution, what we're looking at is the environment. Where in a word do the sounds occur? So a contrastive distribution would mean that we can find what are called minimal pairs where we can find a pair of words that differ only in those sounds, like we saw with dal and tal in uh, Hindi. So that's a contrastive distribution because there's that minimal pair. They mean different things and they differ in that one sound. In English, we're not going to find that. We're not going to find a difference between regular T and aspirated T where it leads to two separate words. So there we need to look for at non-contrastive distribution. There's no minimal pairs. And when we are looking at that, there's two possibilities. It could be in complementary distribution, which is what we find with the regular and the aspirated T. They are in complementary distribution. You never find them in exactly the same position. So, for example, we can find that aspirated T in the word 
tick. And, but we find the non-aspirated T in the word stick. So in other words, that S clearly is making a difference. Um, otherwise, the environment is the same. So by putting that S before the T, then we've changed the environment and you end up with a different allophone. On the other hand, you can get what's called free variation, where a word, and it's the same word and that's important, can be pronounced two different ways. So that's what we saw with hot and hot. So the normal released T, hot, and the unreleased T, hot. Doesn't change the word. It's still the same word, still the same meaning. It's just different pronunciations of the same word. That's free variation. Okay, now, the way I like to think about it is through superheroes. So let's think about um, Clark Kent um, with the glasses, right, versus Bruce Wayne, you know, billionaire playboy. They're in contrastive distribution meaning that we can find them in the same place at the same time, and we know that they are two different, distinct individuals. In other words, uh, their faces mean different things to us. And likewise, Superman and Batman are in contrastive distribution. They can be in the same place at the same time, and they mean different things. On the other hand, we find that Clark Kent and Superman are in complementary distribution. You never find them in the same place at the same time. And being a connoisseur of, of superhero movies and comic books and so on, I know that when you don't find the same person at the same place at the same time, that means that they are the same person. Wait, I didn't they say that right. When you find that two people are never in the same place at the same time, it's a pretty good bet that they're the same individual. So because we never find Clark Kent in the same place as we find Superman, you should guess that Clark Kent is Superman. And likewise, because we never find Bruce Wayne in the same place as Batman, Bruce Wayne's gotta be Batman. So at the emic level, remember that phonemic that we talked about at the beginning, at the emic level, Bruce Wayne is a single individual. But at the edic level, at the level of realization, he can either appear as Bruce Wayne or as Batman. So we know that somehow his essence is Bruce Wayne, but he manifests as either Bruce Wayne or Batman. That's the edict level. I was torn on this one. I think you could argue that at the emic level, um, it's either uh, Clark Kent or it's Superman. Is, is his essence Superman or is his essence Clark Kent? I decided to go with Clark Kent because of his backstory that for you know most of his childhood, he was just Clark Kent. And it wasn't until later that he became Superman. But again, that same idea stands. At the emic level, there's just one individual. And at the edict level, he manifests as two individuals.